Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present here tonight. That was quite an introduction. I don't know where they gleaned all that information from. We know all about you. I do. And yes, I am quite nervous. It's um, quite a venue to, to talk in. Oh, it's working. That's great. That's just going to roll through some, some pictures. I was um, asked in the initial time to give a frontline perspective. St. John management thought that this was a good environment for someone or people who are working on the front line to come and talk um, to MPs and tell them how it is. St. John at the moment uh, don't gather any statistics about alcohol related jobs that we attend. And there's a reason for this, that most of these jobs don't come to us as alcohol related jobs, whilst occasionally some do as alcohol overdoses. The majority of the work comes in as other jobs, unconscious patients, falls, assaults, and so forth. And alcohol is just an underlying theme, but a pretty constant one. What I'd like to do is talk you through maybe what is a typical Friday and Saturday night. We work a 13-hour night shift from 6 o'clock at night till 7 o'clock in the morning. And on a typical Friday and Saturday night in Christchurch, we can expect each ambulance to attend between 10 and 20 incidents. So that's quite a number in town that we do. It's no wonder then that a lot of our staff turn up sort of quietly resigned to the fact that it's going to be a night of hell on Fridays and Saturday nights, particularly around the peak times in seasons such as show week, um, which is quite horrendous. Our night would start off with a typical array of jobs, I guess, things like heart attacks, childbirth, strokes, falls, things like that, you know that we attend typically. However, about 11 p.m., a trend emerges, and it's a predictable trend, and that trend is alcohol. And as I mentioned earlier, we don't keep these statistics, but I can tell you we start seeing these sorts of jobs. We see unconscious patients on Hereford Street, uh, assaults in Manchester Street, for example, self-harm patients, either at home or in town, pedestrian accidents or car accidents. Or some of the jobs that we attend, we affectionately call, are just PFOs, pissed and fell overs. Many of these people just require transport and only transport. No treatment by us and really often no treatment by the hospital emergency department. But where do we take them? It either comes down to us as an emergency service or to the police to look after these people. We cannot leave them in the street vulnerable, and as Glenn said before, potentially vulnerable to sexual predators. So this trend, this continues to around 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. And what you have to remember is that the other work that we were doing before, that doesn't go away. That's all still happening as well. So this sometimes alcohol-related work, it affects many other patients as well, not just the ones that we're seeing now. And it has potentially detrimental effects to these people and may even contribute to someone's death. For an example, many of you here tonight will either be elderly or have elderly relatives who may have uh, lifelink type alarms around their necks. You imagine your nana falls over at home in the hallway at 12.30 on a Friday or Saturday night and she can't get up. She pushes her alarm and our comm centre establishes contact with her and she tells them she's fallen or collapsed in the hallway, but she can talk to them. Chances are that becomes a, what we call a priority two job, a lower priority job, and will wait in the system behind other jobs such as unconscious patients, uh, those that are hemorrhaging, 
um, and those that involve car accidents, for example, but we don't, that we don't know the exact circumstances, they will all be priority one jobs. Frequently, these priority two jobs can wait maybe an hour sometimes if they had to, up to an hour. So eventually an ambulance gets to Nana and they find that the cause of her fall wasn't actually just a simple toppling over, but it was a heart attack. And that is potentially something life-threatening that with an hour earlier of intervention could shave years off her life all because we're dealing with other calls that start to overwhelm us. So frequently, these jobs are stacked up in our system. We rely on volunteer crews from out of town to help us out in the city uh, on Fridays and Saturday nights. They give freely of their time, but it drains their resources in rural areas where generally the people in those areas, if they need an ambulance, they really need an ambulance. And that's a shame if in Darfield you can't get your ambulance because that's in town dealing with our drunk people. The police are frequently involved in our work and either they're waiting for us or we're waiting for them. It's a vicious cycle and that happens. And we rely heavily on them to protect our crews and to help us with violent and uncooperative patients. We don't have any, any choice in that matter. You've got to remember that a lot of these patients, alcohol turns or changes people. And a lot of these patients are threatening, they're abusive, they spit, they punch, um, and they vomit on our staff and in our ambulances. Alcohol also makes it really difficult for us to assess people. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Head injuries, for example, are extremely or greatly complicated by, by alcohol. We can't really tell whether someone has a genuine head injury or just drunk. So, I need to ask you, why is this happening? Well, I mean, alcohol is part of New Zealand culture as much as number eight fence wire. And, you know, it's always been here. What we have noticed in the ambulance side of things is what they're drinking or what we're drinking has changed. The availability of cheap, vodka-based, RTD-type drinks is a real problem for us. Um, and I think also we need to look at this, I'm gonna throw out the challenge here, that we need to look not just at alcohol, but we need to look at some of the bigger issues. Party pills seem to be really available in town. Drugs are becoming more prevalent. And energy drinks that people are mixing with alcohol have sometimes disastrous effects on their body. So we need to look at those and in, a, in a greater context. What can we do? I don't have all the solutions. Um, regulation, controls maybe. I don't think industry regulation is the answer. The tobacco industry, I don't believe, would have banned smoking in public places or restaurants by their own uh, admission. So I can't expect, we can't expect the alcohol industry to do the same, to control their ways. I think there's a good opportunity now for people in this public forum to maybe look at some better partnerships um, between community groups to see what we can do about combating this. All I can tell you is that we need to do something for the long term, not just the short term, but the long term. This needs to be a, a longer process. Ambulance staff, emergency staff, or emergency department staff, and the police that we work with very closely, I think they'd have to agree that, that we're not so sure about the ripple effects of alcohol, because some nights we really feel like we're drowning in a tsunami of vomit. Thank you. <laughs>